Good evening, Springdale family and friends. Uh, it's good to be with you for the midweek devotional talk. I hope you've had a good week. Uh, it's been a hot week, and uh, thankfully, uh, Pastor Don is on some vacation time to uh, refresh and recharge, and so I will be filling in for him for the next two Sundays. And uh, tonight, uh, we want to talk about what are some practical ways that we can exercise our faith in the event that we have made a bad choice or have had a habit of making bad choices. And so let me just summarize in abbreviated fashion Pastor Don's message from Sunday. Uh, first, he said in the life game, uh, we are obviously um, challenged with learning how to make good choices, wise choices. And four things that we need to keep in mind is one, that we need to obviously fear God and trust Him as the authority for our lives. Secondly, uh, acknowledge that there is an enemy and he's very real that will throw lies at us to try to throw us off our life game. And uh, we need to learn how to contend with Him. Thirdly, we need to not only know the truth, but we have to learn how to live in the truth. And therein uh, lies the real test of uh, whether whether we're succeeding or not. And then fourthly, he mentioned that this is no job for a lone ranger. Uh, this happens in the context of relationships. And so if we're going to grow, we have to surround ourselves with a spiritual family that's going to not only give us good counsel, but also reinforce uh, wise counsel as we uh, grow up in our spiritual uh, faith walk. The story is told about a woman who sat quietly and very carefully pondering her next sentence on what she was going to say. Uh, she then leaned forward and the words she said were as follows. She said, God can't bless uh, us. We, we just can't be happy. Uh, we won't be happy. Uh, we should have never been married. Uh, those were her words. She was a woman that was uh, reared in a Christian home. Uh, she grew older. She... Uh, definitely didn't always agree with her parents and over time she deeply resented her parents because uh, the restrictions were restrictions that she just didn't she just didn't didn't buy into and so her parents obviously disapproved for example the the, the, the boys that she was dating uh, arguments would erupt on occasion and of course a wedge would be driven even deeper between the relationship and ultimately, she realized that, yeah, her beliefs were not her parents' beliefs, and she determined to do pretty much what she well pleased. And she did. Uh, by the time she announced her wedding, she was three weeks, uh, three months pregnant, and um, her parents weren't exactly uh, in favor of the decision, but she followed through. And then over time, she uh, had come to the realization that maybe her parents were right, but she was too, uh, too bitter uh, to admit it, too proud to admit it. And she swore that her marriage would in fact work. Uh, and she tried as hard as she knew and it never did. And so only after many years of trying, she finally came to that point where she was humbled and felt the need to come to God for healing. She asked for forgiveness. Uh, she found, you know, uh, God's direction for her life and was able to make wiser choices. But there was one consequence that didn't change, unfortunately, and, and that was that her husband remained unrepentant and unchanged. And so, uh, you know, wise choices definitely have an impact on our lives and lack of wise choices will also have an impact on our lives. The Bible clearly teaches that we do reap what we sow. Uh, if we make wise choices, then we'll reap the benefits. If we made poor and bad choices, we will suffer the consequences. Uh, we don't exactly uh, always uh, understand this when we're young and trying to figure out how to do life. Uh, God gives us a free will, and in doing so, we get to choose what we want. And so God gives us the guardrail warnings, and he's hoping that we'll heed the warning. Uh, but in the event that we don't, then he hopes that uh, 
if and when we hit the guardrail, that, that that'll get our attention. And so while we get to make our own choices, we don't really get to pick the consequences. And the consequences can vary. Uh, they can be small and minor. Uh, they can be large and devastating. Uh, they can be uh, consequences that, quite frankly, we live with the rest of our lives. Uh, they can be deadly. And so it's very important then that we understand what's at, at stake here uh, in terms of our future. So what if we've made our countless mistakes and, and have come to that realization like this young lady that, oh my, I, I haven't exactly uh, uh, made good choices and I, I want to change. I, I want something better. I want something different. Could there ever be a time when one could, after so many mistakes and so many failures, uh, find uh, a better direction? And of course, the answer is always yes. Uh, God's forgiveness is always available. It's never too late. Yes, sin is costly. But that's what God waits. He waits for that moment to come when we finally see the light, when the heat was too intense, that, that we get it. And so... I want to share with you this evening three faith practices that hopefully you're already uh, practicing in your life, uh, or if you're not, then here's a, a place to start. And the first of these three is the need to understand that in confession, we find forgiveness. Now, what is confession? Uh, it's, it's a word that perhaps has got a bad and negative connotation uh, due to the, the legal system. The word simply means to agree with. Uh, if somebody asked me, Ray, where were you on the night of such and such uh, when the donut went missing? And if I said, well, I was uh, in the dining room right next to the kitchen counter where I found the donut eating the donut. And so that would be a clear cut confession, if you will, and of, of me agreeing with the facts that I took the donut. And so when we confess, basically what we're doing is we are agreeing with the truth. We're agreeing with reality. We're telling God, okay, I, I, I see it from your perspective now. Uh, it's been said that in uh, most 12-step programs of recovery, the first uh, step is the hardest step. And that's because it's in the first step that you have to usually... Um, be brutally honest. Maybe it's after you've finally hit bottom. Uh, maybe you're on your way to the bottom and you realize I've got, I've got to stop this. And so you're finally willing to humble yourself and admit, admit that you've been doing it your way, that you've made mistakes, uh, that you've made wrong choices, that you've had shortcomings. And so it's that, it's that point that we sometimes wish would never come because it's painful, but never more painful than the actual consequences of the choices. And so it's actually a turning point. Uh, it's basically when we finally arrive at coming clean with God and saying, yes, I've sinned. I've, I've been uh, willful in my independence apart from you and separate from you, but I'm, I'm willing to now turn around. Uh, and so confession then is a good thing because it doesn't lead to condemnation. Confession leads to forgiveness. Uh, I like the way John wrote in 1 John 1, 9 as he expressed this. He, he writes the following. He says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, when we became Christ followers, we made a decision to confess, agree with that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the Lord, the Savior, and, and our desire to follow him as that. And so that's when our relationship started. Now, after that, obviously, we still have a lot of growing up to do, and sometimes we still may willfully uh, go against God, you know, not follow his will, uh, make decisions contrary to his word. And so when that happens, we break fellowship with him. And so how do we restore, you know, the connection? It's real simple. We just call out sin for what it is 
And as John just told us, he is faithful and just and will forgive us and purify us of all our righteousness. And so that is why we continually uh, you know, fall on the gospel. Uh, it's why the Apostle Paul in Galatians says we cannot afford to fall from grace. It's, grace is everything. And so when we come to God with our shortcomings, what God does is he takes us to the cross of forgiveness, the remedy of sin. And it's at the cross that we can claim Jesus' victory over sin as ours. It's the great exchange, if you will. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, when he said, God made him, meaning Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Jesus' performance then gets credited to us. And what we couldn't do, he did, and now that is transferred to us. There's a trade-off there. So our basis for coming to God is not obviously our worthy performance, it's Jesus' performance, his perfect performance. And when we do that, obviously God forgives us of our sins. And so uh, I think it was important to underline this. We can never, ever uh, get beyond this realization that we are totally dependent on the gospel for forgiveness, even as we're following Christ, because we're going to make mistakes, knowingly or unknowingly. And so we're constantly relying on, on the good news of Jesus. But God doesn't want to just forgive us, as important as that is. He also wants to empower us from the, from the power of sin. He wants to deliver us from the power of sin. So not only do I go to confession for forgiveness, but I also have to admit that, my, that I have a helplessness that, that, that I can't fix that only God can fix. And so I bring to him my weaknesses, my struggles, my temptations, my issues, my problems, so that he can then convert those things into my strengths. Now, 1 John chapter 1, verse 16, uh, John again says, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. So it's very, very important that as I begin to follow Jesus, that I understand the responsibility that comes with walking in the truth. Jesus said that uh, those who steered away from him, who were walking in darkness, would do so because they feared coming to the light and be exposed for their dark deeds. And so as Christ followers, obviously, we acknowledge our mistakes. God takes ownership for those mistakes. And then he gives us a clean slate so that we can then, with the truth that we receive from him, we can practice it. That, that's what Pastor Don was talking about, you know, applying the truth, living in the truth. It's imperative that, that, that I not bury my issues and whatever it is that I struggle with uh, that, that instead that I bring those to the light, right? That, that I bring those to the light so that I can continue my fellowship with God. Fellowship just means to share life with. And so God wants me to be transparent with him. He already knows. And uh, this is why when we make mistakes, uh, we have to build on those mistakes. Uh, isn't it interesting that when you read the Bible, the details aren't left out about the mistake that David made or, you know, whoever we were reading about. Uh, you see it in plain truth, and sometimes it's quite frankly ugly. And what you ask, why is that? Because what makes the good news good news is that it confronts the bad news. And so uh, God wants to bring good even out of the poor choices that we've made. And so... In the process of change, we hear this word repentance, which just means to have a change of mind. And one of the things that we come to the realization of is that we don't have the power to change ourselves. We don't have the power to change our spouse. We just don't. And the sooner we come to grips with that, the sooner we realize, 
I can't create my own sustained motivations. I can't change my emotions to the degree that I'd like to change them. I can't change my behavior the way I'd like to have it be fully changed. I, I can't change my life. And so to change what needs to happen is I need God to come into my life with his power and presence. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul the Apostle writes, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. You see, we are destitute without God. We, we just simply do not even have the basic necessities to do life. But with God on the driver's seat, everything changes. We need him to move in and we need him to work in and to work out through us. And so he takes all this stuff and he works with it and he processes it. That's why spiritual growth is a process. Most of us don't grow overnight. So now what often happens is that we get in a bind and we pray, oh God, help me. Help me, God. And we, we expect God to somehow turn up our willpower, right? Or to increase our human ability. And uh, the truth is to be strong in myself is self-defeating because I'm imperfect. I'm powerless. I'm helpless. I can't change myself. But God can help me if I surrender those things to him those weaknesses to him. Uh, who better to talk about this than the Apostle Paul? He made a lot of bad choices before he was known as the Apostle Paul and he was known as Saul of Tarsus. And uh, he prayed, God, remove this weakness from me. And God didn't do it. God instead let him live with it and, and allowed Paul to, to use it to keep him humble and dependent on God and to trust God and to rely on God. And then Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, when I am weak, then I am strong. And so the best candidates for change, it's, it's those people who are broken. It's those people who are honest. It's when we are willing to be open with God. When we say, yep, yeah, I've got this struggle. Yeah, I've got this weakness. Yeah, I'm defeated. Yes, Lord, I failed. Yeah, I made a bad choice again. And so God specializes in helping that kind of follower. It's no wonder that Jesus said that he didn't come for the, for the ones that were well, but for those who were sick. It's God's idea of life, life success. Success. Um, he's not looking for a perfect life. He already knows the idea was impossible. That was only possible through Jesus on my behalf. What he's looking for is for you and me to give him a life that is surrendered to him. And when we do that, then everything is possible. John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus said, Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so one of the best places to be before God, even though it's a hard place to be, is to, to be at a place of helplessness, powerlessness, because it, it is then that God can say, okay, now let me show you what I can do. And so the first thing I do when I mess up, confess to God. God, I messed up. I know I did, and I, and I, I take ownership for it. Please forgive me. Done. Number two, I admit my helplessness to God. It keeps me humble and continually trusting His strength to fill me, to convert my weakness, my struggle, whatever it is, into a strength. And then thirdly, I have to learn how to live from the inside out. In other words, I have to learn what it means to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit, to walk in the light. We've heard that kind of language. But what does it mean? to be filled with the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit. Uh, does it mean that I'm just going to be jumping for joy all the time with a big smile on my face? Is that really it? Well, I think it means to be able to walk a new life in Jesus Christ. And so I'm able to respond to my situation, my circumstances 
with a Christ-like response because I have him as a resource. I have him as a reference by which now I deal with these things. So to be controlled by the Holy Spirit does not mean that we are controlled by what happens on the outside. It means that we are controlled by what is happening on the inside of my life. That's why we need the Word of God planted in our hearts. That's why we can find guidance, direction, and wisdom if He's speaking to us and we're listening and then we can apply, then we can exercise our faith. And in doing so, He molds us, He shapes us, He grows us, He develops us as a result of the exercising of our faith. That's how we mature and become more like Him. So the power of God within us is what allows us to deal with our life circumstances. For example, the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians, Paul the Apostle talks about how the the Holy Spirit can produce certain qualities in our life. Uh, Love. If I'm dealing with an unlovable person, I need God's love to deal with that person. Peace. Did I lose somebody? God can give me peace to handle the situation better. Joy. I may be enduring some tough times, and yet God can fill me with His joy despite my circumstances on the outside. Patience. A lot of impatient situations that I have to find myself in, so how do I deal with it? God's patience in my heart, being fleshed out in my life, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. How many situations do you find yourself where if you were to act on what you're feeling, it would not be good. But thanks to God's grace and His Spirit, we're able to respond in a spiritual manner that we know is not of the flesh, but that we know is of God. And so those are different ways that God works in us Uh, in our life situations. Let me ask you this question. Did you know that we don't need to, uh, to beg the Holy Spirit to control us, to help us, to direct us? Think about that. I don't need to beg the Holy Spirit to do anything. He actually wants to. He actually delights in guiding and directing and encouraging and all the things I need. So, so what is the obstacle from that happening? There's only one. It's called sin. It's when I am thinking and I'm acting independently of God. It's, it's not that complicated. That, that's what keeps God from being able to do His work in me is when I, via the enemy, via the world, via the flesh, the desires, I block the Holy Spirit. You know, that's why the Bible says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't sadden the Holy Spirit who's actually there already in your life and, he, and He's molding and shaping you, but He's growing you. But, but if, if, you, if you think outside of Him, of course He's not going to be very happy because He already knows the end result of bad choices, consequences. Flesh. I have to learn how to say no to the flesh and how to say yes to the Holy Spirit. Jesus did say to the believing Jews in John chapter 8, verse 31 through about 34, He said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so what He was saying is, this is how you know if you're following Jesus. One, do you have His word? Two, are you remaining faithful to what He's teaching you? In other words, are you actually practicing it? Are are you doing it? Because if you are, He promises this is the result that you will experience. The truth will set you free. God's promise is that He can bring about positive outcomes if I trust Him at His word and I follow it. And he delivers me from the power of sin. So 
three things I shared with you tonight for you to consider as you find yourself um, dealing with choices. How do we overcome bad choices? Number one, stay honest through confession so that God can forgive you. That's true for all of us. Number two, stay humbly dependent on God. Just be honest with Him about whatever weaknesses or struggles that we're dealing with and, and let Him into those areas of our lives so that He can convert them into strengths in our lives. And then thirdly, stay inwardly connected and controlled by the Holy Spirit. Live from the inside out. When I do that, God can change me by His power and presence. I hope you've been encouraged tonight. Let me pray with you. Father, I do thank you for your word. Um, your word is powerful. It's life-changing. And Lord, we realize that we're so dependent on you and your word. And if we could just value the significance of not just knowing it, but applying it. And Lord, I pray that as we see and reap the benefits, that it'll reinforce our faith all the more, that we'll trust you all the more because we see that it works. Father, I just pray that you'll encourage us because we're all vulnerable to sometimes even making bad choices. But your grace is always sufficient, as you said to Paul. And we need not be discouraged, for you're not looking for a perfect life, but you're looking for a faithful life. And so help us to even learn from the not-so-good mistakes. Help us to be honest with others and be able to teach them from our own mistakes. So they, they can see that um, we've learned hard, learned hard way at times too. And Father, may it all be for your glory. May our life be fulfilling because we've discovered that in you, life can be the abundant life as you promised. So bless us, Lord, as only you can. Reinforce us as we do discover uh, how, you, how powerful your word really is in our lives. We love you, Lord. And as always, thank you for loving us first. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you've been blessed today. And um, while we will still be meeting online, I uh, look forward to toward Sunday as I will continue this series as I look at planning ahead. What are four areas of our lives that we hope are in balance uh, to keep our lives fulfilled as God planned? Look forward to talking to you again. God bless you.